you know, just a reminder going back to the syllabus, this is, we're more or less where we need to be in the class uh, for this week. And we'll be talking a little bit next week on surveys and, and some of the issues involved in designs. And then there'll be a video that Joe has done talking a little bit, walking you through our cloud. Uh, so that's kind of what's coming up. And as I said, I'll put some due dates on for the inquisitives uh, for five and six. So when last we were talking, and I'll keep the chat bar open here. When last we were talking, we were on this particular slide. And just to review a little bit, if we're talking about construct validity, there's some of construct validity that goes on with a couple of eyeballs. And you know, one of the things, especially if you're doing a high stakes test, or if you're doing an assessment for a population is to look at the face validity. Uh, and in addition, that kind of has two parts to it. It's, is this going to be a reasonable measure to researchers in your area? But also maybe even more importantly, at least to me is, is this going to be a straightforward assessment to the people you are administrating it to? Because this is the point at which you have some early warning problems going on that maybe the assessment that you are giving is not the assessment you think you're giving. And then content validity is another thing that's a little more systematic. It relates to your theory. Uh, I mentioned I'm from Iowa growing up. We had an awful lot of tests that we were administered as part of the Iowa testing programs. And those people who were designing the test expended a lot of effort driving around to each and every little school in Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, somewhat Missouri, I think, and saying, what syllabus do you have and what are you covering? And we wanna make sure that we're asking questions that samples the content that you are teaching to. And that's, you know, those are things that are done, face validity and content validity, they're done kind of outside the data analysis that you are conducting, they're sort of external considerations. And the other large arm over here on the green button is you know, reliability that deals with, are you going to get kind of the same test scores if you administer it to people? And if you conversely have people rating things, another way to think about assessments is that you have raters that are rating a behavior like amount of aggression going on. And are you, our rater is going to give you kind of the same information. And then internal reliability is looking at survey items itself. Now, if you're thinking about this a little bit in terms of patterns that are the same, you can think of inter-rater reliability as pretty darn close to internal reliability. It's just that when you're talking about inter-rater reliability, the items, so to speak, that you have are the raters. And when you're talking about internal reliability, you have little bitty items. So mathematically, you could kind of say, well, yeah, it was a rater. I could think of that first rater as item one and the second rater as item two. Or I can think of 10 questions that I ask in a survey. You know, it's the same math underlies that. And similarly, test retest reliability is kind of a guess of, you know, if I had an instrument that ran across multiple days, are the numbers I get on day one going to be similar to day two? There are issues involved in thinking about these things. So as the book points out, test, retest, reliability, sometimes good, sometimes not that good, because if the process that you're looking at involves change and growth on the part of people, maybe test, retest, reliability is not going to be high because some people are growing and changing and maybe others are growing and changing, but less so. Um, Inter-rater reliability is also something that you need to think about a little bit carefully because often in the book, for example, they talk about correlations between rater one and rater two. And we'll go through the slides on that in a moment. Well, what if rater one just happens to be a lot harder rater than rater two? Or my wife was always making fun of Midwesterners since she's from Massachusetts. You know, it, it takes 
you know, a rater from the Midwest might not be willing to use the endpoints of a one to five scale. You know, their numbers might only go two, three, four. And somebody else might use the full scale. So even though there's a high correlation between rater one and rater two, do the numbers mean the same thing? Is something you need to think about. One of the things, you know, one of the major themes going on here in the middle are the validity comments. So the, the book talks an awful lot about criterion validity, convergent validity, and discriminant validity. Now, of these, the three things, you know, and we'll go through examples, but criterion validity is kind of the easiest thing to think about because you have some goal, some criterion that you're doing your study for and you want to know if a variable is related to that criterion. Some of the examples eh, in your lives, high school grade points and ACT or SAT composites, how do those relate to actual academic performance in the undergraduate years? In terms of broader issues of psychology, so if you're looking at clinical psychology, we might be interested in knowing if level of depression is related to a criterion for level of treatment or severity of treatment or institutionalization. And we might say, is this going to give us some information about who is and is not at risk? <clears throat> um, in terms of trying to give fun examples, you know, Tom Piasecki is in this department. I've worked a little bit with him and he's interested in hangovers and looking at identifying individuals who report severity of alcohol use and their hangovers. Paradoxically, people who are most prone to hangovers are those individuals who are not that high of consumption. Uh, so you know, those are two variables that he's interested in looking at. Now, the two little orange boxes on the right, convergent and discriminant validity, are more theoretical. So in convergent validity, you would hope that your measure of depression is related to somebody else's measure of depression. And you know, apart from say differences in psychometrics, differences in reliability, you're going to get kind of the same information from them. Discriminant validity is sort of being a skeptic about the construct that you have. So I mean, when I was taking this a thousand years ago, the teacher said, well, convergent validity means it correlates with what it should correlate with and discriminant validity means it doesn't correlate with stuff it shouldn't correlate with. So to use an example, as we're using ACTs and high school GPAs, those things should not correlate with say, SES above and beyond the institutional problems with SES and how that relates to academic performance. It should not relate to say how excited students are. It should not relate to other person. It should not relate to other things that are anxiety related, for example. There should be something separate going on there. So let's see these things in action. Here's criterion validity. So after some of you leave here, you'll be interested in knowing who's going to, you know, who are the people I'm going to hire and will they be good salesmen or poor salespeople? And the scatter plot shows that, you know, in terms of criterion validity, the first aptitude test has a much higher correlation with sales figures than the second one. That is, it identifies quite accurately who are going to be the, the most productive sales people in your business and who are going to be the least, less so. And you know, you're basically just looking at a correlation issue here. Um, that's basically all there is to it. You, in your looking at these aptitude test scores and criterion validity, let's just walk down this road for a little bit. You want to do all the same critical skeptical questions about this correlation coefficient that we talked about in correlations more generally. 
In other words, if I do a study, do I have an outlying observation? Do I have influential observations? Is the relationship of my aptitude test to sales mostly linear or not? And each of those issues is going to have an implication for how you use the test in identifying the criterion. You know, it might be that, especially if you're looking at aptitude test scores, that beyond a certain point, the linear relationship doesn't continue. It kind of goes up for a while and then plateaus off. And that suggests more that you could do a cutoff test on your aptitude test scores and admit, student, admit students, admit people into your business who score at a certain level and above. The nice thing about that is in terms of the legal underpinnings of using aptitude test scores in employment, you can then use that test and then use other variables to accomplish other institutional objectives. You know, and that's kind of a nice thing to, to look at. That particular model is a little more popular in the Netherlands than it is in the United States, but you know, that's kind of a nice thing. Um, in educational settings, like what I do, that's also a nice thing to consider if you are thinking about things like college admissions. You know, maybe there's not that much difference between a student with an ACT composite score of 30 and 36 in terms of whether or not they will succeed while they're in school. So, you know, rather than running in with a little formula and say, I'm going to admit the people with the highest predicted GPAs, which is what you would do if you were using straight lines in a regression model as is shown here, you could just say, I'm going to admit for people above a certain point. And you know, again, that lets you accomplish more goals that you might have as an institution in society. So uh, this is just you know individual little slides that show, yes, you can really, really get a good sense of who's going to be your better and poorer scores. Uh, and you don't have that good of prediction if things are spread out. Sometimes you might want to look at a criterion that's categorical, but you're still doing criterion validity. So in this particular case, you have psychiatrists interview people and you also administer your paper and pencil measure. And hopefully your paper and pencil measure is going to give you scores that will be reflected in the psychiatric judgment of people, whether people are depressed or not. I mean, this is basically a merger of variables, you know, an association between two variables. But in this case, the psychiatrist's judgment is a categorical variable rather than a continuous one. And you can break out shadings of that, you know, one of the problems that the University of Missouri Psych Department has been pretty good at uncovering and some of the work we do at WashU is, especially in clinical psychology, they just love themselves some binary variables, that is variables that take only two levels. And probably it's the case that things like depression, things like sociopathy are not zero one variables. I mean, the reason that people love zero and variables in psychiatry is it comes from a medical model. You know, we think you have a disease. Do you have the disease or don't you? But maybe instead of a binary variable, we could be having an ordinal variable. So in this case, no depressive symptoms, mild, moderate, or severe. But still, the idea is we want some relationship between our measure and this, this ordinal variable. Generally speaking, you know, if you don't have, you know, the, the psychiatrist example of an ordered variable is a nice thing. You should also expect to see target relationships in the very construct you're interested in across various groups. So I believe I had mentioned this last time, but 
you know, the subjective well-being scores for different groups show that you know, college students tend to have scores that are higher in well-being. Korean students have it rough. And I kind of believe that given some of the students I've advised who kind of gotten to know their life histories. And you know, male prison inmates are score very low in well-being. Here's an example of convergent validity. That is, we have one depression measure, the CESD, and the Beck depression inventory on the x-axis. And hopefully, given that these are both continuous variables, we will see a linear relationship going on here. Notice that this scatter plot doesn't look like two normally distributed variables. And this is because you know these scores down here, there's say less than 10 on the Beck depression inventory. That's an awful lot of people down there because people are not really high in their depression, you know, in the population. And the really depressed people are very rare. And the severely depressed, you know, are you know very spread out over here, and there's not many of them. Now it's a little bit hard for me to do interactively here, but if you just did a little snapshot of a scatter plot, I don't know if you're seeing my pointer, but you know this 50 on the CESD and scores that are say lower than 15 on the BDI, if I only looked at those people, my correlation coefficient is not going to be very large. Uh, and really the correlation that we observe in the data of 0.68 is really only there because we have these very extreme scores out here that are giving us the observed correlation. Now, this then ties to the issue that these scores out here are more influential in determining the correlation. If I didn't have these severely depressed people in the study, I wouldn't have found this nice correlation of 0.68. So let's tie that back to a couple of things. We talked about the need to assess populations that are going to benefit from what we're doing. Well, so the argument would go, if you're looking at say a population of undergraduate students in terms of depression, by and large, they are not that depressed of a population. So you can't conduct your convergent validity study on a really homogeneous population. <clears throat> That's kind of what people say. I do, I mean, since I do work in college students, I do have to say though, that although students are not depressed on the whole, they are distressed. That in terms of reports of how upset they are at events in the past two weeks, about half of college students count as clinically distressed populations. I mean, the good news is for a lot of people, this distress level goes down, but the freshman year, oh my gosh, that's a very, very stressful time for a lot of people. Now, we would hope that the scores that you get on a depression inventory are not going to be related to things like physical health problems. So this is an example of discriminant validity. In other words, the answer that you get from the BDI should not be highly correlated with a person actually being sick, even though actually being sick for some people is a significant course of cause of their depression. But you know, this is an example of these scores having very little of a correlation between the two. So keep that in mind, convergent validity and discriminant validity. Here's an example in the book on a scale that is the, you know, a relationship of how much people think that they are appreciated. And these are the items that are used and I believe it's a five point Likert scale. As you're looking at it, if you're going to say, well, let's take a look at the face validity, it kind of looks like these items, you think, have kind of a 
measure of face validity, I guess these are the types of things that people would do in order or covers some of the behaviors that you would say that's an appreciative person. Um, as I mentioned, you know, there are some missing items here, maybe. Maybe, you know, doing things for someone to show that you appreciate them is, is not well represented. These are, you know, a lot of these things are all verbal things. If we skip down and look at the paper that this comes from, da, 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 here we go. This is the paper and it's kind of nice to point out that yes, these are the items that are in that survey. Some of them are reverse coded. In other words, they are the negatives. So instead of a one to five, we score it as a five to one scale. But these people also wanted to do discriminant validity. So the book doesn't talk about this, but the other half of this paper, it talks about how much you are appreciated. And if you read the paper, the important thing about this is to distinguish how much you appreciate someone in a relationship and say, well, that's actually different than feeling appreciated. You know, if those two constructs were the same, you know, two sides of the same coin, you could say, well, really there isn't a how much I appreciate someone variable. <clears throat> All of these items together could be thought of as I'm going to be in an appreciating relationship. But those were found to be the two things. In this study, I mean, this is just to talk a little bit about what's going on here. This number here is called a factor loading. And a high number here means that this particular item is related to a latent variable or a construct of the appreciative subscale. And this thing over here is a cross-loading. That's a measure of the degree to which this particular factor is related to the appreciated subscale. So to the extent that all of these numbers seem to give us high loadings, this is taken for evidence of the construct reliability of that particular measure. And what they're doing over here, this item total correlation of 0.61 is they're taking the item here and then they're making a sum based on, for example, items two through nine and calculating a correlation coefficient between that item and all the rest of the items. And they repeat that process for the rest of these. So this particular item here is then correlated with the mean of item one and items three through nine and so forth. And then down here, we see the means and the variances of the individual items. And they do the same thing down here for the appreciated scale. Now, this is just me making some observation to know this is not gonna be on the test, but this is one of the benefits to actually going in and reading the article that's cited because over the summer when I was reading your book, I went, oh, that sounds like a really nice paper. But going back and actually reading the paper and prep for talking to you folks about it, there's some problems here because they used something called Veramax rotation. That is, they assumed that there are latent variables of appreciative subscale and appreciated subscale, and those things have zero correlation. And if I were reviewing this paper today for a journal, I'd say, well, actually, you probably want to account for the fact that these two sets of items probably have this two constructs probably have a correlation going on. And this is the appreciated subscale. So, you know, this is just me. This is a picture of two people engaging what counts as risky intimacy these days. But down here is the link to the article should you want to go in and take a look at it some more. All right. This particular web page on Wikipedia on validity is kind of a useful one. So, you know, they do cover, if you like to read other things, they're just sort of a short way of summarizing things. That's, you know, 
the statements that they give you here are pretty nice in terms of providing more plain language explanation of what's going on. Um, and instead of criterion validity, they call it predictive validity. But other than that, that's somewhat reasonable. Um, <clears throat> and they talk a little bit about internal validity here. Some of the things that are going on that are worth looking at is that as you think about internal validity, maybe things like history could interfere between your measurements such that your test retest reliability would not be very good. I guess one of the things that's, you know, I guess it's now a dated example, is that large world events like the death of Lady Di, or in my generation, the assassination of Robert Kennedy, people's answers to survey questions varied a lot in that before and after situation. In the times that we're living in now, you, know, you might say how I respond on a test of say life satisfaction or appreciation is probably qualitatively different given this time of COVID from what it's going to be hopefully later when we don't have to live our lives quite this way. So, you know, history could be an issue. Maturation I've talked about, that's, you know, growing older, hungrier, growing, changing. And the nice thing about your lives right now is in across your undergraduate years from freshman to graduation, you're going to change about one standard deviation in a lot of measures of critical thinking and reasoning and verbal ability. You might be surprised to know that on average, about half of that growth happens in the first year or two of your undergraduate experience. But you know that first year is a big thing. Um, testing is another problem. Sometimes when you give someone a test, they don't really know what's going on the first time through. And when you administer the test again, the person doesn't have to take the time to figure out what's the format here? How do I respond? What types of questions am I going to see? You know, there, there are no sudden surprises going on. So testing can also affect internal validity. Instrumentation can also be an issue with internal validity. So when you're doing MRIs, when you're having people wear these little Fitbits and so forth, the moisture, the skin conductance that an individual has from one time to the next is going to affect your measurement. And you need to be aware that that can happen. Uh, I was working in the alcohol lab here, you know, in the bitter cold when people could do experiments in person. And in addition to having people fill out the consents, we had to have them wait a little bit because part of the assessment that we wanted to do was based on the fact that you know, they needed to have their hands warm enough so that you could actually observe what's going on when you give them alcohol. So you know, that's you know, an instrumentation effect that would affect test, test retest and the internal validity of the measurements that you have. Some of that, also deals with what's called the white lab coat effect, that the very first few times that people do a psychological experiment, they're a little bit intimidated by the process or a little bit anxious as to what's going to go on. And after you've done a few experiments, you, you know what's going to happen. So your levels of anxiety, your levels of being nervous, nervous in response to doing things might be different. I won't talk a lot about statistical regression, but if you're looking at extreme scores of people and then retesting them, there's this thing called regression to the mean. That means that your scores are probably going to change when you test again, just due to the fact that the researcher looked at people who were extreme. Some of you might be interested in sports. There's always this thing called the, I think, sophomore slump for baseball players, that if you have a really good first season, 
your next season is going to be worse. Well, the reason that we observe this is we're selecting out baseball players who had a really good first season. Some of that was dumb luck. And the next year, when you follow that person up, their scores will be lower. Uh, in your life, if you are taking college admissions tests, things like the National Merit Scholarship Test, uh, you take it once, you get a high score on it. They then turn around and say, well, okay, we think you might be promising, but we want you to come in and take the SAT. And that's also for that reason, that you can't just at one particular point in time say, oh, here's a high score. I'm going to give you, you know, National Merit Scholarship recommendations. I've always personally had a problem with that because that also does not take into account the fact that due to dumb luck, that's poor luck, you maybe have some deserving people who you know, should have been included, but you know, at least we're aware that that regression issue exists. Selection is another problem with internal validity. And you have to be very careful as to how you identify a population of people to be your comparison group. Individuals who are very aggressive about seeking treatment, for example, are a very different population of people than those who simply sign up and are content to be on a waiting list until they can get services. If you are going to do, for example, a wait list study and you need and, and use that as one of your comparison groups, you need to be aware that you know, maybe those people are systematically different. There are some ways to control this if you're doing your own study. So if you contact someone and you say, hey, do you wanna be in my study? And they say, no, and you say, that's fine. I appreciate that. Do you think you could fill out this little postcard for me just, just to do that? That might give say, whether you're male or female and some other little bits of information or maybe your address because when you go to write up your study, you can then say, you know, these people who did not participate have the following characteristics. And so if, for example, oh, I was kind of trying to tie this to Mizzou student research, men are more likely to refuse to be in a study than women, for example. So if you're identifying a comparison group, you need to be sure to take into account the fact that you might have some gender bias going on. Another threat to internal validity is experimental mortality. That's kind of a grim way of saying people drop out of my study for various reasons. And you know, maybe it's from the treatment group, maybe it's from the experimental group. Experimental mortality also happens if your treatment involves some work. So kind of the, the Nicest example I can think of in that is we used to do work in the department that dealt with eating disorders and with dieting. Well, you can put someone on a plan. You can say, I want you to keep a food log. In other words, not, no calorie restrictions, no nothing. Just whenever you eat something, write it down. And you know, there is some literature to suggest that just writing down what you eat helps a lot, but if you put people in that treatment condition, you also need to account for the fact that there will be people who will drop out of your study because they don't want to go through that effort. How do you then compare your treatment group of people who stayed on in the study with your control group of people it becomes an issue. Basically, you try to identify people, the characteristics of the people who are likely to drop out. And there are some fancy dancy statistics you can do to account for what's called compliance in your study. Selection maturation, I won't get into. That's, it's, it's number eight for a reason. <clears throat> um, external validity is another issue. So, you know, does this generalize, generalize to other people, places, or times? Now, one of the problems here is the interactive effect of testing. So the very fact that you have 
assessed might then increase or decrease scores on a post-test. Some of that can be due to the fact that, as I mentioned above, you know, it's get, kind of getting used to the assessment, but the assessment itself can be a reactive thing. It can cause people to reflect and say, you know what, I think that I'm going to go out, say, and learn something about this because I never knew that these questions were things that were involved. Um, you know, some examples of that in my life, I think the second most cited study I have is on male gender roles uh, and gender role conflict that men, certain classes of men tend to have very rigid gender ideas. And as a result of that, they are less likely to seek therapy or medical assistance actually because of those beliefs. If you're working with assessing people over a long period of time though, when they fill out the form for a small subset of these people, frankly, I tend to think they were more educated young men. When they start reading those items, it causes them to self-reflect and go, hey, you know what? It is kind of stupid to gut through any painful situation or maybe talking with someone about an issue that I have might not be that bad of an idea. And so the measurement instrument kind of puts ideas in their heads about the fact that they might be living a very rigid life. Um, so the very, you know, if you're looking at test retest or if you're doing a therapy thing, the instrument you're using itself could be affecting the scores. Um, Selection bias and your experimental variable can also be an issue. If, for example, certain ethnic groups or men or women or individuals who are happier or less happy, if those things start to affect the both who goes into your study and your experimental variable, you got some problems with the external validity. Um, and you know there are reactive experiments of effects of experimental arrangements such that you can't generalize the effect you found in a non-experimental setting. That's all a fancy way of saying the laboratory situation is on the one hand, a very nice thing. It's controlled. People come into the laboratory at a certain place at a certain time they are exposed to <clears throat> a stimulus or they're exposed to a measurement instrument at that point and you have some control about it. But the very fact that you're exerting all of this control also makes that interaction extremely artificial. So if you're looking at the Milgram experiment, you know maybe the way the Milgram experiment was set up to ask people to be compliant to administer shocks Maybe that was such an artificial situation that it doesn't really generalize to the behavior of people on the street in their lived experience. And multiple treatment interference has to do with the fact that there are carryover effects from one set of experiences that you provide people to another. So, you know, you can't, you know, the book talks a lot about the fact, for example, that longitudinal studies are very nice because the same person is exposed to the different treatments or the different experimental conditions you have. But people are not stupid. And sometimes, you know, you can expose people to a condition and then when you try to expose them to the next condition, they'll say, wait a minute, you know, I was just in this other condition. You can't, well, so let's give some examples of that. One of the things that people do as an experimental intervention sometimes is to have, show people a piece of paper and on that paper are various numbers and letters scattered on the page. And you ask the person to say, to, to do the following, trace a line from the first 
number to the first letter to the next number to the next letter and so forth. And you basically you know, just make that scribble on the page and connect all of the dots. And the deception that's sometimes involved is to say, oh, well, here's your score, you, know, you, you did this. And to tell people, oh, this is actually an intelligence measure, or this is a measure of your math ability. And it's a highly researched thing. And guess what? You didn't score very well. The deception is, there's two deceptions there. A, it's not related to your math ability or intelligence. And B, the experimenter is telling everybody that they didn't do very well. And that's done to induce a sense of frustration in the person. With the other condition is to tell people that they did very well in this. And then to look at how people then perform on another task. Well, you can't put the same person through both of those situations because they're not stupid. You can't say, oh, you did this and you did really poorly and, 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 and this is you know, your destiny and then have them do tasks, the other tasks you're interested in and then say, oh, and by the way, now do this again. And this time I'm going to tell you something completely different. You know, they'll, they'll know something's wrong. You do find though that sometimes you know people do not think about the fact that there might be some interference in the various tasks that you're giving people. Often, you know, there is some work at Missouri in the department that's done on something called priming. So you show people something, and this is supposedly then going to affect their performance on the next task. Some priming things are, for example, showing people a picture of a gun and then having them talk about anxiety or fear of death or showing people a beer can with a Mizzou logo on it and then seeing how they feel about alcohol in general. Well, it can be the case that some of these stimuli may affect not only the target behavior you're looking at, it may affect other things in the assessment as well. Um, so, I mean, I just thought that was nice. These other things, no, no, you are not, you know, responsible for all these other terms of validity. But I thought that that particular web page had a nice discussion of those particular topics. Okay, so that's where we're at, and I see that I'm pretty much out of time today. <laughs>